Hi, Roshni. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Very good. Excellent. And, uh, I cannot see you. You can't see me. Okay. Wait a minute, I'll come back later. I think you just need to switch on your video. Yeah, I'll, I'll re rejoin. No, Roshni, can you hear me and see me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Ranjit is also here. Okay. He is also logging in. Certainly, he's also in the same room. You want to do a test run now? Uh, I think this is fine. This is fine. fine. Okay. Right. I have a presentation for just about 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes or even less. So initially, just to tell you know, tell about the basics, and after that, Ranjit also has a short presentation, and then uh, you take over from there, you know, and then you can ask questions, you repeat the questions, and uh, last 20, 30 minutes, you can uh, uh, oh, uh, questions which are coming from the audience, you can direct them. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ranjit also has joined. Good evening, uh, Ranjit sir. Good evening. Yeah, fine, fine. Well, so I'll just start with a quick uh, introduction for, for the audience here. Well, today I'm having this uh, webinar about COVID-19, which is the pandemic that is happening right now. And we're all uh, stuck up here and we're all wondering what to do, especially this is especially for all the disciples who are uh, wondering how to deal with the situation and how to tackle how to tackle it we will i hope we, i hope this will be useful because we need solutions right now and that's why i requested uh, mohan sir and ranjit sir to come forward today so that we could uh, could be expressed out in english because it's been in demand so i'll just go ahead uh, well our guest dr mohan kamshrum is a famous chief uh, uh, ent surgeon from chennai and he's been a pioneer in cochlear implant uh, surgeries, and he's the founder of Madras CNT Research uh, Foundation from Chennai. And he has contributed to the cochlear implant uh, field in India and abroad, and he has performed about 5,000 uh, surgeries. And he's uh, received plenty of awards. I'll just name just a few. He's received the Padma Shri Award from the President of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee. And he's received the Humanitarian Award by American Academy of Ontology. 
He is, uh, received the best uh, doctor award by the state of Tamil Nadu. And he has a lot more to his credits, which you can Google online. And then uh, comes uh, uh, Ranjit sir. He's the chief audiologist of MRF, and he's also director of uh, MRF Institute of Hearing and Speech and uh, auditory uh, rehabilitation. And he has 23 years of experience in cochlear implant, in implantations and audiology. He's received the best teacher award uh, by uh, Tamil Nadu uh, Dr. MGR University. And he's received the scientific awards in the field of cochlear implant uh, um, at many national and international conferences. Both Mohansar and Ranjistar started the cochlear implantation education program for the parents and for the first time in India and started the first auditory habitation program in India. They contributed to the field in both India and abroad. Today, I salute on behalf of all the disciples, including myself, to our uh, guests here because it is because of them today and their hard work, most of us disciples are actually part of the world of sound. So I shall now let our guests take over for their presentation. Go ahead now. Would you like me to start now, Roshni? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, please. Hello, friends. It's really a pleasure being here with all of you. A special thanks to Roshni Rala for organizing this. It uh, gives me a, a platform to meet all of you. I'm really very happy about it. I want to share with you some of our uh, some of my thoughts on, on COVID-19 and specifically with the uh, relationship to hearing loss also. And uh, we'll start off with uh, the basics of what we know about in fact, uh, what we don't know is much more than what we do know. But let's look at what we do know about COVID-19. And uh, then uh, we'll, we'll uh, spend a little bit of time also about uh, its implications on, on uh, hearing impaired people. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Ranjit, our chief audiologist, will be uh, talking to you about dealing with the problems and uh, maintaining devices during this very difficult, uh, challenging period. So what do we know about coronavirus? Well, coronavirus, and the, the novel coronavirus, as it is named, has spread across the globe at a frightening pace. It started off in November in uh, the Hubei province in China, actually the main city being Wuhan. And from there, it's, it spread right across the globe at a frightening pace. It's paralyzed many countries and, uh, and brought many economies to the brink of collapse. The disease that is caused by this novel coronavirus has been named as the SARS-CoV-2. -CoV SARS standing for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And uh, CoV for Coronavirus 2. And this is to distinguish it from the SARS-CoV, which we already had an earlier version. It also started, unfortunately, from China in 2002. But however, to put things in perspective, coronaviruses have always existed in our community. And most of us, particularly we ENT surgeons, are quite familiar with coronavirus because we do see a lot of patients who have actually uh, coronavirus infections who come with mild, cold, and, and upper respiratory infections. They're usually a very mild, and very self-limited. This present virus, unfortunately, has become a, a very aggressive form of the same coronavirus because of mutation. And mutation is one of the hallmarks of almost all the viruses, uh, which uh, are particularly the, the RNA viruses. There have been two earlier pandemics which have been caused by coronavirus. The SARS-CoV, which we talked about already, and then the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 
which is known as the MERS movie. But the earlier pandemics were more limited in the geographic sense. The, the SARS COVID was limited mainly to China, mainland China, and to Hong Kong. And the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, as the name implies, was mainly limited to the Middle East uh, part of the world. So the impact, although it was quite severe in those areas, it did not really uh, affect the major economies, it did not affect uh, uh, across the globe like we are facing now. Why is it called a coronavirus? So that's a, a picture uh, of uh, the sun's corona taken during a total eclipse. You can see the, the kind of uh, halo around the sun. And this is exactly how the virus looks under the ultra microscope. It has a, a corona around it, which is formed by spikes, which come out of the virus. So the virus is a, it's a sphere, but there are spikes sticking out. And this is known as, there's known as a spike protein. And that's very important or attachment of the virus to the cells in the human body. Now, basically, what do bats have to do with it? Because we're all talking about bats being the culprit. Well, the coronavirus is, pro is, pro is generally a zoonotic virus. Now, what do we mean by that? It's a virus which is prevalent in animals, which then jumps to human beings. So it's a, a zoo is known as a zoonotic virus. And bats have a lot of viruses, including coronaviruses. But the bats don't get sick. They're quite healthy. They're just carrying the viruses and uh, disseminating them as it were. But they don't really become sick from the virus. Now, the two earlier uh, pandemics which we had, the SARS-CoV and the MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, from MERS-CoV, both originated from bats. But they jumped to another intermediary host, which is another animal. And from that animal, it again jumped into humans. So the coronavirus is famous for this, for jumping from species. So in the case of SARS-CoV, it jumped to a civet cat. We think it's a civet cat, from a civet cat to humans. Whereas in the MERS-CoV, it went to a camel, and from the camel, it came to humans. So basically, the camel and the civet cat were both intermediary hosts, so they didn't get sick. So the humans who were affected, Now, what kind of virus is it? We, we call it an RNA virus. What do we mean? But there are many viruses like the HIV virus, the measles virus, or the Ebola virus. Uh, the coronavirus also is an RNA. It's known as an RNA, single-stranded virus. Now, what is RNA? Ribonucleic acid. RNA is normally very important in all body functions. It is the messenger between the DNA and the protein. The DNA, which is in the nucleus, is, is where our chromosomes are, and then the nucleus, the chromosomes there, and from the, the chromosomes uh, are uh, carrying the DNA, which is the genetic information. Now, each DNA will code for a particular protein, and the RNA is what acts as a messenger between the DNA and the proteins. So normal cells, the DNA information is copied to an RNA, which then is goes from the nucleus outside to the cell to build the proteins that the body needs. So there is a very complex mechanism in the cell, what is known as the cytoplasm, where the RNA goes and drives the gadgets which are necessary for forming the proteins, which are essential for life. Now, Normally, this is how the human cell functions. But when a cell becomes infected by a coronavirus, it's the entire machinery meant for forming proteins is simply hijacked by the viral protein. If unchecked, what happens is the viral RNA goes and takes over this complex mechanism in the human cell and directs the human cell to start forming viral uh, proteins instead of the human proteins that they normally supposed to make. So this leads to more virus production. So one virus takes over charge and, and uh, clones itself, starts making numerous copies of the virus within the cell. Very soon the virus is overwhelmed, or the, the cell is overwhelmed by the virus, and then the cell ruptures, and then the virus is going on to infect the next cell. 
this process is unrelenting it goes on and on and on till there are no more cells left to infect so it's a very frightening scenario but fortunately this doesn't happen all the time because there is a, a defense mechanism also in the human body the moment this happens the human body's immune system starts identifying this process and starts producing antibodies to the virus these antibodies then go and attack the virus and then prevents the virus from multiplying more and infecting more cells and the process is brought to a halt the only problem is there is a time lag between the virus starting its attack and the body producing the antibodies and it is in this time lag that the virus does its maximum harm and it can do a lot of damage which may sometimes become irreversible leading to severe illness so this is where the problem is so there's little time lag between the virus going on its rampage and the body reacting by forming its antibodies so how did it start how did the whole process start in somewhere in november last year the end of uh, last year the covid originated in uh, the wuhan city in hubei province in china in fact they have traced it more or less to a, a seafood market there and this thought that the virus made its jump from the bats to the uh, uh, seafood uh, uh, market and from there to the humans fortunately wuhan is a very important city in china and for in fact uh, globally also it's a very important uh, center of education in china and it is also uh, an important industrial city which has connections with cities all over the world and therefore people travel to and away from wuhan all the time from all over the world and therefore the disease quickly spread to other countries before the alarm bells could be raised and the infection rapidly became a pandemic how does the virus affect the body the virus primarily infects cells that line the upper respiratory tract namely the nose the mouth and the eyes it attaches to a, a particular protein on the surface of the human body cell this protein is known as a receptor and this particular receptor is known as the ACE2 receptor angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor normally this receptor is important for maintaining maintaining the blood pressure in the human body the virus has sneaked its way into this receptor and found a back door for it to enter the cell and by gaining entry through this receptor the virus then multiplies inside the cell and then the whole process starts as i said it hijacks the mechanism for formation of protein and uh, starts replicating inside the cell there is normally a period which is known as an incubation period which is the period between the point at which the day on which the virus enters the cell and the time at which the symptoms start appearing this is a silent period when the virus is already in the body but the symptoms are not appear and this is normally it variable it could vary anything from 2 days 12 days for simplicity we usually say 2 weeks to be on the safe side so 2 weeks or 14 days but normally it's a range from 2 days to 12 days and during this period sir many of these people who are carrying the viruses can become infected or others also now um, how does the covid 19 present does everyone who have covid 19 do they become sick no not at all in fact the vast majority about 50 to 60% even of people who have been infected with the virus are completely and totally asymptomatic if you talk to them they'll be very surprised 
to know that they even have the virus because they are normal. They are absolutely normal like any one of us. They are going about, they have no, no symptoms, they don't feel tired, they don't have any illness. They are totally, completely unaware of the fact that they are having the virus. So this is a, a big group. And this is a group which is very important because they, can, they are still infective and they can transmit the virus to other people. So they are known as asymptomatic carriers because they can carry the infection, carry the virus and spread it around to others. This is one of the reasons why this virus has been so infectious and has spread so rapidly all over the globe. Another 10 or 20 percent they start having symptoms which are significant but not lethal. They may be kept at home and monitored some of them, if they become a little more uh, sick, they may be shifted to hospital population. But they do recover and they go home. In only about 20% of people who are affected by the virus, is the disease uh, a serious one? It runs a stormy course. And they will, uh, they, it runs a stormy course because the virus starts affecting the lung and then further on, it may start affecting other organs. And they may end up with uh, what is known as uh, uh, an ARDS or they may end up with multi-system failure or multi-organ failure. When it affects the lung, the ability for us to exchange oxygen in the lung gets severely affected. So the uh, main symptom is that people start becoming very breathless they feel short of breath, there is air hunger. And if you monitor the saturation, the saturation is normally about 100%. And sometimes, you know, give or take one or two, may come to 99 or 90, but generally it's around 100%, most of us. And this saturation will start dropping, sometimes to even below 90%. That's quite significant. So these are people who will need support for breathing. And this is what we call ventilation. That's a ventilator which can artificially breathe for you. And these are people who will uh, need this ventilatory support. Some of them, even with ventilation, the oxygenation may not be enough. And this is because the damage to the, the lung uh, surface, the membrane, which is known as the alveolar membrane, Lung, where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place, the membrane may be so severely damaged and inflamed that even if we're giving them full ventilation, enough exchange of gases may not happen in the lung. When they reach a very critical level, when ventilation starts failing, the only recourse is known as an egg form. This extracorporeal membrane oxygenation where the blood itself is circulated into a machine and it takes over the function of the lung where the gas is exchanged with an oxygen CO2 is taking place. But this is a very, very critical situation and uh, in fact, when somebody enters into the situation where they are in some need of ventilation and ventilatory support, about 20% of such people actually back alive. The vast majority of them, unfortunately, we can't save them. It's a very difficult, almost a terminal situation. Now, it's thought that COVID, many people have the impression that COVID is a problem or is a disease of elderly people. Nothing could be farther from the truth. All age groups can contract a virus and can be infected with the coronavirus. All coronavirus. In young children, however, it has an extremely mild course. Some of these very young children, babies, and children up to the age of even 10 or 12, seem to be quite uh, uh, resistant to the disease. Some reason, we don't know why. But after that age, most all of us, whether you are uh, over the age of 15 or to, you know, 80s or 90s, anybody can contract the virus. But in more elderly people, the disease may run a more severe course. 
and the reason for that is not because uh, you know the, the virus is more aggressive in older people but because many of them have other problems which will contribute to the illness and when i say other problems we call this comorbidities like diabetes mellitus for example hypertension heart disease copd so these are all other diseases which can actually influence the course of the coronavirus infection it's for this reason elderly people we see a higher uh, mortality as the people dying is more elderly than the younger healthier group but that is not to say that the younger group are uh, you know going to come out completely unscathed in fact experience from uh, us as well as from italy and, and spain and even china uh, has shown in south korea has shown that many people who die at least a third of them are between the ages of about 15 to 30 so young people do uh, get severe infections among them and some of them unfortunately also suffer from this in general even though it's a very highly infectious disease it's not a very virulent disease compared to the previous pandemics like the SARS and the make of 2002 3 or the MERS uh, pandemic here the mortality actual mortality rate is much lower around 2 to 3 percent whereas in SARS uh, pandemic which we had before it was almost about 15 to 20 percent so in general it's a less virulent but more infectious virus but the problem is that many many more people have been affected by the virus compared to the previous pandemics and therefore the total number of deaths even though the percentage is lower the total number of deaths is going up by the year what are the main symptoms of the person who is affected as i said a good number of them may be completely without symptoms but if they do have symptoms the, the cardinal symptom is fever and this fever could be very high fever well above 100 degrees fahrenheit and uh, you know it could uh, may not even sometimes respond to routine uh, uh, medicines for fever like paracetamol and so on there's also a dry cough in in most of the people in a, about a third of these uh, patients there one of the main early presenting symptom is really enough loss of smell and along with the loss of smell there is also a loss of flavor which is associated with taste of course and therefore they have what is known as a dysgeusia or altered taste sensation they may not like the taste of it some of them present with gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea good number of them complain about severe fatigue tiredness body aches and malaise and eventually a lot of them may also go in for breathlessness as i said they may have shortness of breath and they have what is known as air hunger and this indicates involvement of the lung this is an important sign that you need hospitalization and the proportion of them may even end up in icu for ventilation So how do we diagnose this? What are the tests that we do? The uh, gold standard test, as it were, for uh, detecting the virus, is what is known as an RT-PCR or a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. It's a, a, a very specific test where the swab is taken from the back of the nose, which is known as nasopharynx. one of the favorite uh, sites for the virus to reside in and also from throat or from the mucus from the trachea or lung and uh, this is then uh, put in a via transport medium a virus transport medium and take to the lab but uh, it's kept in a very particular temperature and then immediately this test is performed this is slightly expensive to perform and uh, we usually you get the results within a day or a maximum of two days it's a very specific test it's quite sensitive but in a, in a small number in about 20 to 25% it may be 
negative, uh, even if the person carries the virus, not as known as a false negative. And this may be because of the way the sample is taken and, and so on and so forth. So it's a very tedious process of sampling and it has to be done very precisely. So because of that, the number of people, some, sometimes you get a negative result. And for this reason, in a person who is symptomatic and we suspect that the virus is uh, in person, just because they have one negative test, we don't discharge them. We actually repeat the test twice or sometimes even thrice. And unless we get two or three consecutive negative samples, he is not discharged or not in hospital. There are also some antibody tests. Now, what are these antibody tests? Now, the first test, as I said, RT-PCR actually detects the antigen, which is a virus. The antibody test does not detect the virus. What it detects is the antibody or the, the, uh, uh, the body's resistance to the virus. So when we have the virus infection, our immune system, as I said earlier, starts producing antibodies which, which utilize the virus. Now this test is meant to detect these antibodies. As I already said, the body takes some time for the antibodies to form. It doesn't happen immediately after the virus uh, happens. In fact, sometimes the antibodies may be only detected after a week or even sometimes even later. So the antibody test is not of great use in the early diagnosis. But the advantage is it's a rapid test. You can have the results within uh, a, you know, a few minutes, maybe in a half an hour's time. So if somebody has an antibody test positive, what it really means is, A, that the person has been exposed to the virus, and B, this person actually has the resistance in the body to face the virus. So in, in a way, it's a good thing. It tells you that you are prepared to face the virus. So what is its significance? It has uh, uh, two main uh, applications. One, it is useful in health workers, people like me, for example, doctors, nurses, health workers, and people who are at high risk, like uh, essential services, like police, fire service, and so on, who are being exposed to the virus. Uh, if the test is done on us, and we find that the test is positive, it means that we have the resistance in our body to fight the virus. So it's actually a good sign. The second important application of this test is to find out the, the community's response. Now, what do you mean? Now, if you have a, a small uh, a village or, or town in which we are living, if you do the test for everyone in the village, we know the number of people who have developed the virus and we know the number of people who have developed resistance. So if a large number of people in the community develop antibodies and have resistance, then we have what is known as herd immunity. We then are in a much better situation to kick the virus out. The virus then leaves the community because it can't fight everyone in the community who has resistance. So it's helpful for the surveillance of the, of the population. It also is helpful for us to know when we can scale down on our strict uh, social isolation. Apart from these tests, the other useful test which we do is x-rays. A chest x-ray may show changes in the lung. Similarly, ultrasound, which is also a, a, a non-invasive uh, test for radiology, also helps. And a CT scan has a typical what is known as a ground glass appearance in the lung, particularly in the periphery of the lung. The other uh, investigation which is helpful is to monitor the oxygen saturation of it. As I said, when the virus starts affecting the lung, the oxygen saturation starts dropping, sometimes to even below. So this is also a useful tool. How does the virus spread? Mainly through respiratory droplets. So every time I talk, I sing, I cough, I sneeze, I'm throwing droplets of mucus into the atmosphere around me. And these uh, uh, viruses are plenty in these droplets. In fact, there may be lakhs, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. 
these droplets. Normally, when I cough, my droplets can go to a distance of about a meter. But if I cough very violently, it may even reach up to two meters. It is calculated that the uh, virus can remain suspended in the air in these droplets for even up to three hours sometimes. And this is uh, important because if somebody comes in close proximity, then they can get infected from the droplets which are suspended in the atmosphere. Although we're not absolutely sure about this, but this is how the virus can remain and get transmitted. It's known as an aerosol transmission. Although we have no direct proof for this as of yet, many people suspect that this could be a fact. But there's no doubt that if somebody is in front of me and I cough on them, and the droplets containing virus reaches them, they get infected. Another way of getting it is that when I cough or sneeze and I have the virus, the virus may settle on hard surfaces like a table or a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic. And if it settles on these hard surfaces, it can live much longer, even up to a day or even up to two days. And if somebody comes and then touches the surface, then they get the virus in their hand. And if they take it to their mouth or hand, they can easily pass it. So this is another way in which the virus can be passed, which is why we keep delicate and keep washing. In average, it is estimated that every person who is infected has a chance of transmitting it to an average of one to three people. This is known as the reproduction number. Number of people that each person infects on an average anything from one to three. So how do we prevent the spread? There's really no drug which can prevent the virus from infecting anybody else. So, you know, if I think that I'm taking a medicine and that's going to prevent me from getting the virus, then that's not true. At the present moment, the only way in which we can prevent really spreading is by social distancing. Because you keep away from anybody who could be a potential carrier. As I said, frequent hand washing with soap and water. Soap and water is excellent for destroying the, the capsule of the virus, which is a fatty layer. So the soap simply uh, destroys this viral capsule. Similarly, alcohol-based hand sanitizers also are helpful because that also dissolves this fatty coat or what we know as the, what we call the lipid coat. Wear masks when going to public places. If I wear a mask, <coughs> then I, when I cough, I prevent the droplets from going outside. If everyone does this, then the virus does not go outside into the atmosphere. And we prevent the, the, the spread or the RO. So we limit the number of people who get Actually, so it's not enough if I alone wear it, but everyone around me has to wear it also. And there are different kinds of masks. The N95 mask is a mask which is used by healthcare workers. It is a very uh, layered mask. It is got very fine filters, and it affords an, an element of protection. But mind you, no mask is 100% but there are also other masks and cloth masks which can be used by people. This prevents the virus from transmitting outside, as I said, but it does not prevent the virus from entering into you, somebody else comes. So wearing a mask is not a protection from getting infected from the virus, no matter what the mask is. But it is a means of preventing transmission of the virus from the person who is wearing the mask. Now, are there any treatment options? Well, generally, when a person is sick in the hospital, there are many supportive things that we do. We treat the fever, we treat the cough. If the oxygen starts going down, we support them with oxygen. 
and then there's what is known as a non-invasive ventilation. And if it gets more severe, then they may need ventilation. And as I said, in very terminal cases, ECMO has been used. So these are all measures in which it can be taken. They're supportive measures. What about drugs? There's really no conclusive evidence to say that any drug actually Hydroxychloroquine, about <coughs> which a lot has been said in recent times, became popular because President Trump actually touted it as a very important uh, uh, drug, the game changer, in own words. Uh, but was tempered down by Dr. Fauci, who actually said that there's less evidence for it. But what is the evidence still now? It's not very conclusive, really. The evidence that we have till now is that there have been a few trials in hydroxychloroquine in different countries which seem to promise that the virus load can be reduced. Now, hydroxychloroquine is an old drug. It's been mainly introduced for treatment of malaria. In fact, the native Indians of Peru, who were the first to use Sincona bar for treating fever, and then the Europeans who went there realized that they were using it for treating fever. And they also realized that they, they, it contained an active principle called quinine. And this quinine was helpful in treating malaria, which was then a major illness. So malaria was uh, uh, rampant, and therefore the, the, the British introduced quinine as a treatment for malaria in the colonies. But quinine is a very, very bitter drug and it's extremely difficult to take it. In fact, if you we actually want to induce vomiting in somebody, you just have to give a little quinine. So the, the, the Brits actually found a very clever way of giving quinine. And this is how gin and tonic came. Tonic water is nothing but quinine water. So they mixed uh, the gin with uh, uh, tonic water, which is quinine, and Make sure that all their uh, soldiers had gin and tonic, as long as a gentleman's drink, and made sure that everybody had a bit of quinine. Uh, but an analog uh, of quinine is chloroquine. And chloroquine has the same efficacy against malaria, but it's much less side effects than quinine. Therefore, chloroquine became popular. Proxy chloroquine is yet another analog which has even less side effects than chloroquine. It has been used in treatment of malaria for quite some time now. The nine tested drug. But we also know that it is a drug which has effects on the immune system. It's an immunomodulator. It in fact suppresses an overzealous immune system at times. For this reason, it has been used in many diseases caused by the immune system or autoimmune diseases like my rheumatoid uh, fever, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, lupus and so on. It's an autoimmune disease. There are also drugs which are specifically against viral viruses, as antiviral drugs. And I've given you a list there. Remdesivir, lopinavir, etnavir. These are all antiviral drugs. Remdesivir uh, was uh, brought in with a lot of hope, but uh, we have not found actually uh, the promise that it was delivered. Opinavir uh, is a drug which is used mainly for HIV AIDS. It's been tried. And uh, beta interferon is another drug which is uh, actually used by the body against virus. This has also been tried. And these are all drugs which are now currently being uh, in undergoing trial in various countries. In fact, more than uh, almost 1,000 trials happening at the same time as SP. And uh, WHO has initiated a multinational trial known as Solidarity, where many of these drugs are being tested by several centers across the world. It's a massive human effort to find a fit cure. So, what is the end point? When do we get out of this pandemic? And how do we get out of this pandemic? For this, we need to have developed sufficient immunity in the population. This is what we call herd immunity. 
if the majority of the people or the overwhelming majority of the people in the community have developed antibodies to the virus, then the virus theoretically should leave the community. This can also be achieved artificially by vaccination. Because vaccination induces the antibodies to be formed in the immune system of the body. So like smallpox, for example, was eradicated, polio was eradicated, all by vaccination. So similarly, we're also hopeful that we will develop a vaccine against the virus and inoculate to enough people in the community, develop herd immunity so that we can stop the virus. But in many ways, this is a little uh, premature and I think uh, a very optimistic view of things. For one reason, this virus has shown time and again that it can mutate very easily. It can change its scope. It can change its appearance very easily. As I speak, there have been reports which have said that as it is, they have noted at least 30 mutations in the virus, final, final mutations, everything is. But already the virus is showing that it can start mutating. There are reports of COVID-19 happening in canines, in, in cats. And there's one report of a, a tiger in, uh, in the New York Bronx Zoo having COVID-19. So it's shown that it can jump from species to species. So will the vaccine be, be produced work against all these mutations? Well, we don't know, time will tell. But we're all hoping that it will, and that we will develop enough herd immunity to uh, actually pack up the virus and send it and we cannot get back to our normal way of life. Now, what about hearing loss? Can COVID-19 cause hearing loss? This is not a very common thing. Not many people with COVID-19 have hearing loss. But there are a few reports which are anecdotal, but which are nevertheless interesting. In the US, as well as from Spain, even from Italy, of some people who have developed hearing loss, which is uh, quite significant. It's always accompanied by fever. It occurs in the early stages. <coughs> it's accompanied by a loss of smell, meaning, and invariably it's temporary, it recovers, usually within a couple of weeks. Well, the first thought we have is, is it because of the respiratory problem? Is there a blockage of the station tube? It doesn't seem to be because these people did not have any cold neck symptoms, although they had anosmia. So the possible mechanism is thought to be uh, uh, what is known as serous labyrinthitis, which is a uh, reversible temporary inflammation of the inner ear. But they don't have any vertigo. It's only the hearing loss and it is a feeling of blockage and fullness and hearing loss, which usually recovers in a couple of weeks. The loss of smell that they complain, anosmia, is also a kind of neuropathy or damage to the nerve of smell, and that also is temporary, and that also is. So that's good news. So even if you have a hearing loss with COVID-19, it is temporary. But other coronaviruses are known to cause hearing loss, and that could be due to middle ear problem, due to damage of the middle ear mucous membrane and so on. But that's not the novel coronavirus, it's a, uh, the usual coronaviruses which we see. Do we have to take any special considerations in people with hearing loss? Yeah, yes. One very important consideration is don't take hydroxychloroquine to relaxes blindly by yourself, unless it is given by medical supervision. Now, the reason is, there is a subset of people who have profound hearing loss called the gerbil lang nielsen syndrome, or what is known as a long QT syndrome. These are people who have conduction defects in their heart, in the electrical conduction within the heart. In these people, hydroxychloroquine can aggravate the condition and produce arrhythmias or changes in the heartbeat, which are even fatal. <coughs> so these people 
can even die from hydroxychloroquine. And if you add azithromycin, azithromycin also causes similar changes. So you have to be very, very cautious when taking hydroxychloroquine. It always has to be done under medical supervision, not randomly. Because the reason I'm saying this is a lot of people ask me, can we go to the, uh, you know, the closest pharmacy and buy hydroxychloroquine? Said, no, please don't do that. Hydroxychloroquine has important side effects on the heart. It can affect vision. It can cause severe headache, nausea, vomiting in some people. It's not a drug with uh, a lot of effects. So it don't, it's not to be taken uh, lightly and without proper medical What about cochlear implant surgery? Can we do this in the presence of pandemic? Well, this is a, a very a difficult question to answer. On the one side, you have uh, children waiting for cochlear implants and you want to do it early because you want to give them healing as soon as possible and make them get back to habitation at the earliest. On the other side, the surgery on the mastoid, it's what uh, cochlear implant surgery is, is involves drilling on the bone. And this produces a lot of aerosol. And if the person on whom surgery is being done is a carrier of coronavirus, this aerosol is transmitted all over the operation theater, and all the personnel in the theater can get infected. In fact, very early uh, days in Wuhan, one of the most serious infections of health workers happened in ENT surgeries like mastoid surgeries, endoscopic surgeries, and so on. So aerosol-producing surgeries have to be really uh, considered very carefully. And if at all we are going to be doing uh, surgery, we have to test the uh, person who is going to go through the surgery with an RT-PCR and make sure that they are not carriers of the virus, they're not asymptomatic carriers. It's important that this is screened before they take off the surgery. So this is a, a, a theater scene uh, recently from our own theater. You can see how the personnel are all protected. And this is me with a, a complete protection kit, the hazmat suit underneath, face shield, goggles, two gloves, and then two aprons over the hazmat suit. Look at the, the, the mess. I mean, this is really terrible because you feel like you're being cooked inside all this. But you have to carry on precision surgery nevertheless. So unless the surgery is absolutely warranted, you don't want to be jumping and doing it till the actual pandemic uh, 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 tails off and, or, or uh, plateaus, or plateaus. And we are seeing the number of cases falling and people are slowly getting back to normal. Certainly, we don't want to be doing it during a period of lockdown when people have to remain at home. We don't want them traveling to a hospital. What are the take-home points? Basically, despite all the, the fear and panic, it is a mild self limiting disease. But assume that every person you meet will go out is a potential Carrier. Take special care of the elderly and sick. Social isolation is the way to go. Frequent hand washing with soap and water or alcohol based desanitizers helps. Compulsory wearing of masks brings down the infectivity as a whole in the community. And do not take so-called preventive medication unless you are inspected by your doctor. Follow instructions of the local administrative doctor because they have taken all this into consideration. And the situation may change from time to time, real time. Stay safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mohan, sir. Uh, uh, Ranjit, sir, are you here? Ranjisha, are you here? Okay. 
रोशनी कहीं कहीं भी Just just give us a second. Yeah, much better, much better. Okay. <clears throat> Roshni? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. You're more sorry. Can you hear me, Roshni? I can't hear you. Now can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, once again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you too. Okay, good. So, <coughs> I will share my presentation now to you. Yeah, please. Okay, so good evening Roshni and good evening to everyone and uh, thanks for organizing such a wonderful uh, interaction and um, as uh, followed by uh, Mohan sir what he has explained about and how he has explained about this uh, uh, COVID and the importance of uh, keeping social distance. I would like to add on a few more things uh, from my perspective because I'm an audiologist who predominantly deal with uh, patients with cochlear implants. And most often we see a lot of patients with uh, different types of uh, uh, issues and complaints. And our job is to make sure that we troubleshoot their device, we give them proper advice, we uh, do appropriate programming for them. And followed by programming, we also give them uh, appropriate rehabilitation. And during the period of rehabilitation, we also monitor them from time to time. And whenever it is required, we also have a small clinical meeting along with uh, uh, Mohan sir and other uh, members of the team to improve the quality of the patients. So this is the, uh, in general, this is how we work in, in MERV. Now, what I'm going to uh, talk to you today is uh, uh, basically on care and maintenance of cochlear implant devices. And I have uh, uh, two uh, separate uh, components of this presentation. The first component of the presentation is uh, general care and maintenance, irrespective of uh, whatever device you use. The second component is a specific care and maintenance of each uh, devices. So in MERV, we support all patients who, uh, irrespective of whatever devices they use. So in India, predominantly there are three major cochlear implant companies, which is an advanced bionics, cochlear and medic. These are three major cochlear implant uh, uh, companies in India. So which means almost 97% to 98% of the implantees in India are using either of in any of these three companies, one of these three companies. So in MERV, we support all the three companies. We implant patients with uh, all these three devices based on the choice and need. Uh, of the patient. Now, uh, before I go into this care and maintenance, I would like to give you a, a very important information uh, with respect to this COVID. Now, recently, last week, we had a patient, uh, uh, one of our patients called us and then he was asking about a very specific and important question. That is, how do I make sure that this virus doesn't spread to the implant or the sound processor, external sound processor. So this is a very valid question because what happens today is, you know, kids go out and they play quite often. And even if there, it's a lockdown period, it's very difficult to control these kids. And um, maximum they could control for five hours, six hours, at least one hour when they live in a, a big condominium or they live in an apartment, they always get along with other kids. and. The social distance is very difficult to maintain among these kids. So this is one uh, a practical difficulty that all the parents face uh, with children. 
And second important thing is when the uh, um, the family members they get in contact with other people outside, or for example, if the father is going out to buy some vegetables or buy some fruits or from groceries, there's a high possibility that he can uh, be a potential carrier of this virus. So how do we make sure that uh, this they don't pass on the virus to the device or to the children? Now the most important thing is whenever the uh, children go out for uh, I mean uh, for playing when they go and meet other kids and make sure these kids before they come into their house they completely clean sanitize them especially their hands and most importantly before before uh, uh, after clean cleansing their hands remove the processor from their hair clean the processor with alcohol or uh, 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 the sterilium, you know, nowadays you have this hand sanitizers, you can even use the hand sanitizers, you know, spray some hand sanitizers in, the, in, in a small cotton or a very soft cloth and wipe the processor completely, okay, and all the, all the uh, components of the processor, which includes the, uh, uh, the sound processor, the battery case, the coil, the cable, everything, clean it, and then ask the child to go and have a shower, um, a shower before they Come into the house, or you know, before they get into any other activity inside the house, and even uh, the uh, parents when they go out and when they have to, uh, when they come inside their house, the most important first they should do is they have to clean themselves, and and then they go and uh, be in contact with the family members or the children. So this is something which they have to follow uh, very meticulously, very very important. And the second important thing is, you know, one of the parents was asking me last time, you know, you know they carry the money with them, you know, they, uh, they have money to go and buy these groceries and they give 500 rupees to buy something and they receive a change of 300 rupees or some kind of thing. So what is the possibility of this uh, virus, you know, sticking on to the, uh, uh, the currency notes? That could be a possibility, but what is more important is, uh, a very common advice that we give to, to all these parents is to keep the only one parent is advised to go and buy groceries and they keep the money in one specific wallet and they don't keep the money everywhere they keep the money in the wallet and they only use the wallet they clean the wallet once they come into the house with some spirit and only they use the wallet don't uh, allow anybody to touch the wallet so only one person handles the wallet so this is one way of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, controlling the uh, spread. So with this, I'll go into this uh, specific care and maintenance of this uh, uh, cochlear implant devices. Now, so I've uh, borrowed slides and informations from all the three companies to give a good visual representation, which will make the uh, parents and the uh, uh, recipients who are listening to this uh, 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 video to make them understand much better. Now, so if you look at the care and maintenance, the few general things, irrespective of whatever device you use, whether you use a metal or a, 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 a nucleus device or an advanced bionic device, you have to really take care of the device because now this device, the external sound processor, is the ear of the child. This is not a device. You should never treat this device as a device because this is the ear. If this device is not functioning, your child will not be able to hear anything. So this device is not a device. This is part of a human body. So that is how you have to consider. Now, every day you take care of your children. So you take care of them in many ways. You give them good hygiene. You give them good uh, 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 food. Um, and you give them all the necessary things to for them to uh, keep growing very healthy. Now, how does this happen? You don't do it once in three months. You don't do it every week. You do it every day. So very similarly, you will have to take care of these devices every day. So there are a few tips that we would like to give you on what are the things that you need to take care every day and what are the uh, uh, things that you need to take care of weekly and uh, quarterly. Now, if you look at these uh, um, um, uh, devices, the devices has got a lot of components. Now, device has got a microphone, device has got a coil, device has got a cable, device has got a battery, battery case, battery charger, sound processor, microphone, everything. Now, 
very similarly how you take care of every uh, parts of your body so you brush your teeth to take care of your teeth <clears throat> you shower to take care of yourself you know uh, to cleanse your body you eat every day to keep yourself healthy and then you also rest very well to recharge yourself so all this these things also happen to the device and you don't and whenever there is a rain you don't go and play in the rain or even if you want to go in the rain you always have your protective uh, clothing or protective gear which prevents you from getting excess wet or prevents you from getting some other uh, uh, infections or a cold or cough due to this rain so we take care of ourselves very well so very similarly you have to take care of the devices as well now what are the uh, uh, tools that you use to take care of yourself you need a towel you use brush you have good food you need a good uh, a bed you have a good uh, quilt to uh, uh, keep you warm and uh, you also have a, a rain gear so similarly to take care of this cochlear implant device there are different gears that has been provided by company now the, there could be a question what happens if we lose this gears you know is it necessary that we have to buy these gears only from the company not necessarily not necessarily see if you look at some of these basic device uh, tools are something which you can even buy it from the local market not necessarily you have to buy it from the company or not necessarily you have to buy it from the clinic so you can even buy it from the local market now what is the basic uh, uh, tools that are required to take care of a device every day number one you need to clean the device so you need a very nice um, clean and lint free cloth and you need to you need a brush a soft brush to remove the dust from the device and you need a dry aid box and a battery charger to charge the batteries to rejuvenate the batteries and also a dry aid store to basically remove the moisture from the uh, devices so these are the tools that you need to use basic tools okay and i would i would go one step uh, ahead and i'll also ask you possibly by this uh, alcohol swabs that's available in the uh, pharmacies most of the pharmacies sell those swabs if not just keep buy some cottons okay, and have a uh, 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 surgical spirit or by the use the sanitizers to clean it now so every day you have to clean your processor which is very very important the reason why you have to clean the processor every day is simply because so we all live in and uh, we live in india india is a very noisy country very dusty country and the sweat that is produced from our body is high content of salt because we take lot of salt and because of the high content of salt there is to be a possibility of salt deposition in the processors or in the uh, uh, nook and corners of the very small areas in the processors and uh, because the children go to school every day or they go out for playing there is high possibility that lot of dust can get deposited in the uh, device so these are the two main reasons that you have to clean the device every day meticulously i would advise you to clean it once in the morning and once in the evening and uh, after you when you clean this device there are two ways that you can clean the device you can clean the device using a dry cloth initially clean the device with a dry cloth later clean the device with a uh, a cotton soaked in a uh, of, uh, soaked and squeezed with a uh, alcohol or uh, some kind of uh, surgical spirit or uh, sanitizer so with the don't clean the processor directly using alcohol first clean it with a dry cloth and then use a wet cloth to clean the processor now there are some places in the uh, uh, areas in the processor where it is very difficult for you to clean with a cloth so you need a brush to clean it so use a brush and use a soft brush don't use a hard brush use a soft brush clean you keep two brushes one brush is a dry brush another brush you can use it you can dip the brush in a uh, in the alcohol or a spirit and then you can first use a dry brush clean the uh, uh, processor then use the uh, uh, wet brush to clean the processor now in spite of using the brush you can still examine if you examine closely you may still find some dust sticking out of the uh, uh, processors so what you can do is very simple thing 
you blow you blow and blow the dust out of it now in the market you also get some soft blowers and hard blowers it's very simple it's like a, a small uh, 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 rubber balloon small a hard one so when you press those balloon that that gives a lot of pressure it it's, it pushes the air with a lot of pressure which can uh, remove the dust inside the or on the surfaces of the processes so use the brush or use the uh, uh, air pump to clean the processor now this is something very important I mean, if you look at this particular area of the sound processor this is where not only the dust lot of salt gets deposited and these pins gets oxidized because of the sweat so this is quite common in india especially very common in coastal areas so people living in the coastal area you have to be very careful on about this particular thing and examine it every day it's very important some people might advise you to clean it once a week once in a month but i would advise you to clean it every day because if you lose one of this pin no service can be done you have to change the entire processor and you know the cost of the entire processor is going to cost you not less than 2.5 lakhs so instead of spending 2.5 lakhs if you spend just 2 minutes every day cleaning those uh, uh, pins and that would that would definitely increase the longevity of the device and the quality of the device and also it doesn't reduces your overheads now this is another situation now if you look at this particular condition you see it is completely a uh, uh, misuse of the uh, device so what happens is lot of dust gets deposited there lot of oxidation salts get deposited there on top of it if you start wearing the device without cleaning see it damages the entire device okay. and the, the sensitivity of the contacts go off peels off so once the contact sensitivity goes away there may be intermittency in this uh, in hearing now as an adult you may be able to say the intermittency as a child they may not be able to say the intermittency so what happens because of that the quality of hearing suffers so the children will not be able to appreciate the quality of hearing till they reach a level where they will know how to appreciate the quality of hearing that means they have to reach a stage where they can express the quality of hearing so which usually happens when they are only if, if you implant a child by the age of um, one year the child will be able to appreciate the quality of hearing by the age of 6 to 7 years so for the first two years the child will not be verbally expressive to say they appreciate the quality of hearing <clears throat> So quality of hearing may suffer because of this as well. Now this is another condition where uh, the, uh, the the screws around the devices can also get damaged if it is not taken care of. Either. Now the next important thing is you need to feed uh, <clears throat> the battery. So like you need to charge it. So the, there are two types of batteries. One is a disposable battery and the rechargeable battery. Now I would advise you to have both disposable and rechargeable battery. There are a lot of advantages of disposable battery and disadvantages of disposable battery. There are also a lot of advantages of uh, um, uh, rechargeable and disadvantages of rechargeable battery. Now, if you ask me when it comes to the cost of maintaining the battery, both rechargeable and the disposable battery, more or less, it's the same. But the advantage of having a disposable battery is it's low on maintenance because a disposable, when you use a disposable battery, you don't need a charger to recharge it. So you don't need to maintain another component. And in case if the charger conks off due to very high voltage fluctuations, which is quite common in uh, India, but there are different types of charges depending on the what device you buy. So some of the charges are very sensitive, some of the charges are not very sensitive. So I'm giving you a general uh, 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 opinion. So charges are uh, highly sensitive for high fluctuations of voltages. And in India, you know, you know that you know the voltages are not very stable in all parts of India. You know there are some villages where the voltages are very highly fluctuating. So now maintaining the charger is again an additional expense. So. In case, if you, I mean, and in, in, the, in, in those kind of situations, the disposable batteries are very useful. One, even if you don't have an uh, electricity at home, if you can't charge your rechargeable battery, 
you can use a disposable battery immediately. And if you're, if you're traveling for a longer distance of 10 hours or 12 hours, and you don't have a means of uh, recharging your battery, you can always use a disposable battery. So that is why I'm telling you have option of both rechargeable and the disposable battery. Because if you can't recharge a battery, if your battery drains off and your device will not work and the child will not, will not be able to hear. So even one minute or half an hour or one day of de depriving a child with uh, without hearing is not advisable because that might cause a lot of psychological trauma to the child. So how do you make uh, number one, you need to recharge this battery. Now the recharging instructions are given in your in manual. Now the instruction vary from company to company and device to device. So I cannot, I won't be able to tell you at this point of time, what are the instructions? Maybe when I discuss about specific device, we'll be able to, I'll be able to specifically uh, uh, explain about the instructions of that. But however, two basic principle in recharging is charging the battery 100% and charging the battery 50% or less than 50% or less than 100%. So a fully charged battery and a semi-charged battery. Now, how do you know that would be indicated by a different types of LED status. Now, for example, a specific company, an A company, the LED status will glow green when the battery is full. A, a, a company B will have a LED light glowing steadily when the battery is full. And LED light will be blinking when the battery is getting charged. So please refer to your manual and then check what is the charging status and please charge your battery completely. Don't use a semi-charged battery, which is not advisable. Now, how long do you have to charge? It's a good question. Again, it varies from the uh, brand to brand, but my advice is you charge it for a period of four hours to five hours. I think most of the batteries will get charged 100%. Now, when do I charge it? Do I charge it on the daytime or at the night time? Well, it depends upon number of batteries you have. You only have one battery, then you don't have a choice. You will have to charge it only when you go to sleep. Now, if you don't, if you have two batteries or three batteries as an um, uh, extra spare batteries, and I would advise you to charge those batteries in the, during the daytime because exactly after four hours, you can just switch off the uh, charger. So that what happens that really prevents your charger getting damaged more than the battery, it prevents your charger getting damaged, it prevents your charger getting overheated, and it, it also prevents your charger uh, uh, um, uh, escaping from very loud, I mean, sorry, very high voltages. Okay. So, have always have a spare battery. If you don't have a spare battery, you will have to charge the battery only at night time. Now the cables. So quite often, what happens with the cable is the ca you. I mean, this is a very common complaint from most of the uh, patients, especially children, that the cables get uh, worn out so quickly. And this is possible when the cables uh, are not uh, maintained properly. So what happens when the child use the cable and they keep moving the head, and sometimes you know, a couple of times, or three to four times, the child may have to remove and uh, fix the uh, device. Now the cables get twisted, quite often they get twisted and uh, this cables has to be untwisted. That's very, very important. So every day when the child comes uh, home after school, you have to take out the cable, untwist it and make it uh, and, and refix the uh, cable on the processor. And of course, at night, before the, uh, uh, the child removes the device or after the child removes the device, before the child goes to bed, again, see, untwist the uh, uh, cables and put it in your dry case or in a case where you used to store it. Now, in the morning, again, when the, before the child wears the device, make sure the cable is not twisted, untwisted and fix it. So this is a very simple way of preventing uh, your cable being uh, warning out so quickly. And also one more thing, clean the cable properly. It's very important. Now, see, every device has a dry age store. Now, some of the uh, companies give an electronic dry age store. Some of the companies give a manual dry age store. But both the dry age stores works fine. There is not much of a difference. 
Now, what is more important is when you use uh, the dry age store, you have to put the entire processor inside. So, some people might have a habit of just putting the processor and not putting the, uh, the battery component or the coil. So, we would advise put the entire processor inside and put it in a dry age kit and store it overnight. Now, if you're using a, a electronic dry aid kit, make sure the dry aid kit is working and make sure some of the dry aid kits are battery operated. Some of the dry aid kits are no, you, it's a, you have to get an AC current directly. Make sure you plug it and you make sure that uh, the, 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 it gets a power supply. Otherwise, it is very difficult. It, it, won't, it won't work. And one of the uh, uh, risk of uh, having moisture in the processor is specifically the microphone. The microphone gets damaged quite fast. When the microphone gets damaged quite fast, what happens is the sound that reaches the, 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 the energy level goes down. For example, when I say, uh, when I call somebody, if, if, I call, if I have to call Roshini, and this is my normal volume. So my, uh, the, the intensity level when at, at a normal speech conversation is around 50 dB at a 5 feet distance. Now, if you have a sensitive microphone, this will pick up the 50 dB as 50 dB. If you have a microphone which is not sensitive, the 50 dB will be heard only as 30 dB at 20 dB. So, the sound level, the intensity level, it goes down. So, that is why it is very important to maintain the uh, microphone. And microphone has, microphones are very highly sensitive for humidity. And that's why if you look at any microphones, if you look at the TV anchors or the... the, the uh, 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 the, uh, the media people, the journalists, they always put a soft um, cushion over the microphone to avoid many things. One of the important things is the moisture. So it also avoids the wind noise and many other things, but one of the important things is moisture. Now, in summary, number one, you have to clean the processor regularly using a dry cloth and a wet cloth. And you have to clean the very small hinges in the processors using a, using a brush or a, a, a air pressure blower. You have to charge your batteries. And if you're using a rechargeable battery, you also have to take care of your charge, which is very important. If you're using a disposable battery, and uh, you only have to look up the expiry of the battery, and most, most of the batteries have long expiry date. But however, you have to check the expiry date of the battery very important and fourth one is very very important look at the cable which is very commonly uh, get damaged and the fifth one use the prop the processor in the dry aid box before you go to bed these are the daily uh, checklists that you have to do and these are the daily uh, 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 care that you have to do for your sound processor irrespective of whatever device you use now, what are the weekly activities? The weekly activities, maybe you can remove the cable, you can clean the uh, transmitting coil very thoroughly okay, using a spirit, and you can remove the magnet from the transmitting coil and clean the magnet because some of the processor has got a magnet where you open and just fix the magnet and lock the transmitting coil. Some of the transmitting has, coil has got a magnet where you have to screw the magnet in, in the transmitting coil. So especially the transmitting coil where you have to screw the magnet, you have to clean it very carefully. And that's something which is uh, which needs a very good cleaning because what happens is most of the Indian children or most of the Indians use oil over their hair. Now the oil and the, pro the transmitting coil also absorbs oil or the oil, uh, uh, when you apply oil, you know, there's some amount of oil that also gets onto the transmitting coil and when you put a oil on the transmitting coil, it attracts a lot of dust. So when it attracts a lot of dust, and all this small, small dust go and settle between the screws of your magnet and the transmitting coil. So what happens if you don't clean it, at some point of time, you may not be able to remove the uh, magnet from the uh, transmitting coil. So what happens, you may have to change the entire transmitting coil. Or when you, you have to Put more pressure to remove the magnet, ultimately you damage the entire transmitting coil. So the transmitting coil is very expensive. It's not running in 
two, I mean, uh, it's, it's definitely not less than 15,000 or 20,000 rupees. It's more than 20,000 rupees. And it varies from company to company. So it's a very expensive company. So please make sure that every week we remove the magnet and clean the magnet properly and refix the magnet. At the same time, remove the cables and clean the cables. The reason why we want you to remove the cable once a week is because there are, the cable has got two ends. One end goes to the sound processor, the other end goes to the transmitting coil. Okay. Now, the, the, both the ends and especially uh, the, 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 the cable that connects to the transmitting coil may attract a lot of dust because of the oil. Okay. And the, uh, uh, the socket at the sound processor attracts a lot of uh, dust due to sweat. Okay. So you have to be very careful when you're cleaning it. Clean both the ends. Just please use the spirit or alcohol or uh, alcohol swabs when you clean those uh, hinges and use the brush to clean it. Right. Now, once, once quarterly, every quarterly, what you have to do is you have one thing which is very important, very often what our patients forget is to change the dry aid brick. Now, this dry aid brick, life is not more than two to three months. Maximum, it will go up to three months. So, it is advisable to change once in two months. So, this is something which you need to change it. So, every time you put a brick, what I would advise my uh, patients is write the date. When you, the moment you open this brick, write the date, use a, a marker, use a permanent marker or a pen, you write the date on the brick. So you have two months time from that particular uh, date of uh, installation. So after two months, you may have to change the brick, okay, which means before two months, in case if you're running out of enough bricks, order it from the company or from the clinic and keep it in extra stock. Now, every three months, you have to change the microphone protecting cover, okay. Some processor has got microphone protecting cover, some of the processor don't have it. Now, the processors which has a microphone protection cover, the protection cover has to be changed once in three months, okay. Now, sometimes you may have to even change it before three months, especially when your child says the child is not able to hear properly. Okay? There could be many reasons why the child is not able to hear properly. One of the reasons could be very poor sensitivity of the mic and the, sometimes the mic may not be really uh, desensitive but the, if the protective cover is covered by a lot of dust, the microphone sensitivity can be affected. So it's advised to change the microphone cover protectors once in uh, three months. Okay, so this is about the uh, general care and maintenance of uh, all the three devices so daily weekly and quarterly devices now now I, what i would ask roshini at this point of time he i have a lot of uh, slides which describes about the maintenance of each device a lot of slides on so that would take a longer time in case if parents has got any question for moon sir and also for me up till now we would like to answer this uh, uh, at this point of time and then we'll go ahead with the care and maintenance of each device specifically. Uh, thank you uh, Randi sir. Um, yes. But I think if you if you can, can you uh, speak about uh, for advanced bionics and metals, can you just share a few tips for their care and maintenance for their processors as well? Certainly, I will. I will definitely do it. I'll definitely do it for advanced bionics and also for metal. I've got a lot of information to share with you on different processors because what happens is um, each company has got different types of processors, right? So. So that's going to take a little longer time, but I don't mind spending time with you. But before that, if you have any questions for Mohan sir, if any of the parents have got questions for Mohan sir, so please, please ask those questions. Sir would be happy to answer those questions. Uh, okay. Um, well, we have one question here uh, for Mohan sir from uh, Dr. Sanjish Joshi. Uh, when can we start plant surgery and what precautions should be taken 
it is necessary to do COVID testing before doing surgery. Yes. Uh, one, sir. Uh, one, one, one second, Roger. One second. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, we yeah. have one question here from Dr. Sanjay Joshi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when can we when can we start plan surgery, and what precautions can be taken? Is it necessary to do COVID testing before doing surgery? Yeah. Excellent question. Uh, see, we, as I already said, we have uh, two things to take into consideration. On one side, you don't want to postpone too long. One side, oh, sorry. there's a sort of uh, yeah, on the side. Yeah, yeah. Roshni, Roshni. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh, one of the uh, participants has switched on their microphone. Can you ask them to mute it because we're getting a feedback. Okay. Everyone is muted. Uh, There's not a lot of time. Okay. Uh, Ranji sir, I think you need to switch off your mute so that uh, Mohan sir I'm, can see. I have switched off. A moment, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just waiting for the right to view. Right. I think uh, the, the question was a very good one. You know, uh, when do we start surgery? So you, you see, there are two things to take into consideration. One, you don't want to delay endlessly because we really don't know when this is going to end. And as I said, the end point is very tenuous. You know, it depends on the community developing enough immunity and virus going. More likely, we are going to see like influenza. You know, that it's not going to go completely, but we're going to actually get over it and get back normal, and then we're going to see other waves coming in smaller waves. So that's probably going to be the pattern. So in other words, we are going to learn to live with this virus for some time. So that being the case, you can't obviously postpone surgeries endlessly. You have to do at some point of time. So once the lockdown is over, that's an indication that social uh, community transmission has come down government feels confident to end the lockdown, then the surgeries will start. And cochlear implant surgeries will be one of the early surgeries to start in children particularly because we are really pressed for time in, in children. And when we start, we will initially do routine screening for COVID for all patients who are going to undergo surgery, elective surgeries. No matter what, not only for Parkland implant, 
But for any elective surgery, whether it is going to be a sinus operation, whether it's going to be a tonsil operation, whether it's going to be a ear operation, it doesn't matter. Every elective surgical case will have a routine COVID testing like they do for a lot of things. For example, now, if you're going to be doing, before this COVID happened, if you're going to be doing any surgeries, we would automatically check for hepatitis, we would check for HIV routinely. Similarly, here also, we'll be now adding to that list COVID testing also. If the test is negative, that's fine. You know, so you, you have a good idea that this patient is probably fine. It's not a carrier, not an asymptomatic carrier. And as I said, it's more for protection of the personnel in the uh, operating room. Uh, but at the same time, just because you've got a negative test, it doesn't mean that you know, you're know you completely free. As I said, there's about a 30% possibility of uh, you know a false negative. So therefore, you have to take precautions also. And the precautions will mean that you take proper masks, you know, the personnel, they wear goggles, particularly in these procedures where you're doing a lot of drilling and aerosol is formed. So the short answer is yes, we will start doing the surgeries as soon as the lockdown period is over. And we will make sure that there's a part of the preoperative testing, COVID test also is done. And we'll also make sure that all the personnel are protected properly. Despite a negative test, we still protect and then we do it. If the COVID test comes positive, then you defer the surgery by a full month so that the person comes out of the virus and is virus free. And you get a negative test before you leave. Okay. Um... There's a question from uh, uh, Ms. Amrita Choras here, and uh, she says we have cochlear N7 device, and uh, can we can we show that we can clean the device with hand sanitizer? This is a question uh, for Ranjit. I think can we use hand sanitizer? See, basically, hand sanitizers are alcohol solutions, so you know they're fine. You can actually put them in soft cloth, and you can use it for cleaning it. it should because it happens very quickly. So I think it's just quite fine. Uh, you know, rather than use water or, or soap, I think this is a better option. Uh, or as, as Ranjit said, you can use this alcohol swabs also. And they evaporate very fast. So they don't stay on linger, you know, within a few seconds. But they are very effective in, in taking away the virus. So the alcohol is an excellent uh, medium for uh, sanitizing any tool uh, from the virus and you have to do it unfortunately in this period you have to think about sanitizing every device and as Ranjit explained I think uh, children are particularly prone you know they mix they play and there is a possibility of viral contamination so you have to take it personally uh, and we have here uh, from uh uh, from uh, Saipian uh, Neha Prakash, uh, she's yes. doing her uh, advanced bionics this Saipian from us. Yes. Yeah. And she, her father has a question. Is yeah. that? Can you, I see the question. You know, she Neha got an implant in the left ear by 2010. So wondering whether she can go for the other year as well. Yes, in fact, she should. See the the. There's no doubt that two years are better than one. Absolutely no doubt. I and mean, we have solid evidence for it. We have every uh, you know proof that when children use two years, they do far better than they're using only one year. It stands reason. It's common sense. You have only one year hearing and two years hearing. You know the difference. How much your ear blocks you for running? You sort it out. So the uh, ideally, you know, we like to do it as soon as possible. The moment you do one year, you want immediately either at the same sitting, which is called uh, bilateral simultaneous, or as early as possible. But there are financial considerations, and you know, it, basically finances have to be prepared. So uh, the, the correct answer is that the earliest opportunity you should do it, do the other year. 10 years is a bit long, yes, but still this may have a benefit you know, second year. So yes, the answer is an unequivocal yes. 
do it at the earliest. Don't uh, hesitate to do it. Um, well, you know, uh, there are, there's one another parent who actually sent me the and email. Then the, I think again, they, were, they made a point. They have inquired here in at Los Angeles and they are not encouraging because they said it could impact the hearing on the left ear and kids might get irritated with different sounds. Now that's not true. The, the, the experience worldwide is that, you know, when you do the second year after a long gap, you still get benefit. Uh, but the benefit is not as much as you do when you get the two years done together. Uh, it's a little less. So. There are some uh, benefits which are, uh, you know, very obvious. You, know, you do the two years together, uh, but when you there is a big lag between the two sides, uh, there is uh, some loss of benefit. But you still have benefit. It's still better than having one year. Away. No doubt about that. Uh, yeah, Ranjit wants to add something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Ranjit sir. Yeah. Um, here, I think the next few questions is about the um, uh, uh, dry uh, keeping batteries in the dry kit box. Okay. Now, before that, I will. Yeah. Before that, I would like to answer uh, the previous question for going for cochlear implant on the second side for Neha Prahash after ten years. I think as Mohan sir rightly said, two years is always better than one year. But I think they might have inquired uh, with some, um, I mean, uh, some universities in uh, US has not recommended it for them. No, what you have to do is, even if you go for an implant after 10 years, what matters a lot is how do you train the second year implant? So how do you train the second year with the second device? Now, because for the last 10 years, this child has been using the device for right ear. For example, if they're using the device only for the right ear. So the entire brain, okay, is tuned to receive information from the right ear. Right. Now you add another device on the left side. Initially, brain may not accept it. Okay. The child may not find the quality of sound as good as the first device because the gap is very long. That's why Mohan sir said the lesser the gap is always better. The brain will accept it much better. Right. Now, what you have to do is, even after 10 years, you can still wear the device, but they have to go for a very special training, okay, which is called a staggered method of training, where they will train the, uh, uh, the brain to also to acclimatize to the sound from the left side, which is the second implant. So the training is important and the training is a little different. So when they use the device for the first uh, first time when they received the implant on the right ear when the child was young, 2010, I think the training was totally different. Now the child is receiving another device, okay, on the left side. Okay, after a gap of 10 years, the child has to undergo a, a different kind of training. And before before now the child must be at least uh, 14 years old or 15 years old now, right? Now the now. They should also inform the child the child is going to get a device on the second side. They should explain what are the advantages of using the device on the second side and what are the uh, difficulties initially the child will be facing when they receive the device on the second side and what is the extra training the child has to undergo. Because when they are adolescent, very quite often they can quickly reject the device and they, if they don't like it. So this is something very important that they have to consider before they go for the Second device, especially with the longer gap uh, uh, yeah, between the first and the second. To the second question, do you have to put the uh, batteries in the dry box? No, you don't have to put the batteries in the dry box. Not necessary. If you just clean the batteries, that's enough. Yeah. I don't see the questions in this. Sanitizer is wet and it can create moisture with the device. Okay, now see the sanitizer is wet in the sense you're going to spray the sanit. Uh, uh, I mean, you mean in, in the cloth is wetted with the sanitizer, right? The cloth, when the cloth is wetted with the sanitizer, it evaporates it so quickly because it's alcohol. 
but if you wet the cloth with water then it's it's not advisable so that's why I don't use a wet cloth wet cloth means what i meant is not the cloth wetted with water wetted with a sanitizer or alcohol or a spirit and uh, the other question was uh, she has an, uh, an advanced bionics device in the left ear, then should she go for the same product in the right ear? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's just a matter of convenience. There's no such rule uh, you know, that you have to use the same company for both sides, but it is easier for you to deal with one company rather than deal with two companies. So it's more a practical thing than uh, uh, you know, any other reason. So if you have uh, the same company device on the other side also, it is so much easier for you because you have, if anything goes wrong, you know, you, you, are, you deal with the same company, not with two different companies, and it only adds on to the complexity. That's all the logic actually. Yeah? Then, uh, those are the questions which are being posted. Any other questions, Roshni? Uh, yeah, uh, I think there was uh, uh, one um, parent, uh, he asked a question. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat, please? One second. Yeah, there is one uh, question which is not mentioned here in the question in, in the Q&A, but had been emailed in advance. This is one question is that what is the... Uh, uh, what are the do's and uh, don'ts that uh, we recipients should uh, follow right now, especially during the pandemic, uh, this lockdown right now? During this lockdown, what are the do's and don'ts that we should follow? We recipients have to follow to maintain, uh, to keep our ears clean and we can hear properly. Oh, no, nothing at all. You know, you don't have to clean the ears. First of all, COVID doesn't go into the ear uh, and doesn't you know, enter the body through the ear. The ear is protected by skin. The COVID needs mucous membrane. So we say only nose and mouth and eyes are the only portals of entry, not the ear. Uh, the ear, as a rule, does not need any cleaning. Now, that's a very important uh, takeaway message, I think. You don't have to use Johnson buds. You don't have to use cloth, soft cloth, cotton, nothing. Ear is the only organ in the body which cleans itself. So it actually... The wax which is secreted comes out and falls out and you wipe it out. And if you put anything to try and clean it, you just actually push it back in the opposite direction. So that's when the problem starts. So don't try and clean the ear inside the ear canal. Just open and clean outside with soap and water when you have a bath and then wipe it clean, but not inside. And don't pour anything into the ear or anything else. So no special cleaning of the ear and COVID does not enter through the ear. Well, as we know that also right now, there's a lot of speech therapy sessions also happening online. So would there be any possibility of having uh, mapping sessions also online as well? Can you hear me, Roshni? Uh, yes, Rajni, sir. Okay. Like, um, see, teletherapy is definitely possible. We have been doing it in Murph. Now, to explain about the concept of mapping, uh, telemapping, what we call it is a remote mapping. We call it as remote mapping. This is not a new concept. But I'll show you a very... Uh, uh, I've prepared a slide to make people understand about remote mapping so that they really get the concept of what remote mapping is. Now, remote mapping is nothing but a procedure where you can map a specific patient, okay, who's sitting at any part of this world, any corner of the world. Now, what is important in remote mapping is... Yeah, 
Can you see this uh, screen over this one? Yes, okay. Okay, this is the regular mapping. So if you look at the regular mapping, you have a, uh, the audiologist, patient, patient's caretaker, and there is a laptop. The laptop has the software to program, okay, or map. Now this software differs from one company to another company. Even in the same company, there are different versions of the software available. Now this computer is connected to the, it is not connected to the sound processor directly. There is a small tool between the computer and the sound processor. So this is called the interface box. Different companies have different interface boxes. And even uh, there are some companies in, in one of the company, the interface box also differs from one type of processor to another type of processor. So this interface box is the link between the sound processor and the computer. And this is the interface box, right? Now, without this interface box, we cannot do mapping. We cannot do programming. Now, you can connect a computer. You can connect a computer from the clinicians. This is the audiologist computer, okay? Now, this is the patient's computer at home, and this is the patient. So, you can connect this computer to this computer, okay, using an internet. But you cannot connect this computer to this programming interface. You see, there is a programming interface here, right? So, this is the biggest glitch in doing a remote mapping. Now, in spite of that, how we could do remote mapping is, now, you, if you have an interface with you, then remote mapping is possible. If the, the, if the patient does not have an interface box with them, the remote mapping is not possible. Okay. Now, how does the remote mapping work? There is something called remote programming, um, uh, which is happening in, in different places. So, we also do remote programming in, 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 uh, in MERF. So, how do we do remote pro programming? Yes. We have our satellite centers at different places. Our satellite centers have the programming interface. Patients, instead of coming from uh, uh, Madurai to Chennai, or the patients instead of coming from Kanyakumari to Chennai, they can go to the nearby satellite center and they can connect their processor to the interface which we have installed in the satellite center. And one of our clinicians from MERF can do mapping to that particular patient. This is called remote mapping. So remote mapping is possible provided the programming interface is available. So if the patient cannot buy an independent programming interface, which is very expensive and usually you don't get it, it's not possible to get it. So they can, they can get an access to the close by center where the programming interface is available. And using that programming interface, then we can do the mapping. That is possible. So the biggest technical glitch here is the programming interface. Otherwise, remote mapping is very much possible. Uh, the other, <clears throat> this, 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 this another question uh, from uh, from Jana uh, in uh, Singapore. She says there's no dry brick for metal, and my representative in Singapore says the port place in silicon box. You think it's necessary? Yes, it is necessary because Singapore uh, again is a very hot and humid, uh, very high humidity. So it makes a lot of sense to have a, a dry box, a, a simple silica box is very very effective. Uh, you know, all that you want to do is to take away the moisture. From it. So yes, it it makes a lot of sense to get a simple box of silica and then put the box uh, overnight uh, the uh, processor and then take it out in the morning. Uh, does the implant affect vision by any chance? No, it does not affect it. But keep in mind that there are certain conditions where hearing loss and visual loss can go together, like Usher's syndrome. Some people, you know, may not have been found earlier on, but later on they may find that the vision is going down and you go check out. Always you have to check it out, make sure that you don't have this kind of condition because this is a serious condition where the visual loss can go things. Right. So you need to. Um, uh, Mohan sir, actually very recently, some few, some of the uh, recipients may have been just recently implanted just before lockdown. 
and uh, for their activation is also still pending so uh, how do they have to how do they have to deal with this uh, is there any solution for them right now it's genuinely a problem Roshni, and it's a very distressing problem uh, we ourselves have patients with that you know who have had surgeries and have not been able to have such a long term i think we just have to bear with it you know we have to, unfortunately we can't travel now we and as ranjit explained you know you need to have an interface box if you're going to use it so the switch on uh, can only happen when the actual active lockdown gets over i think it's going to take uh, at least another month in my opinion uh, for that to actually happen uh, so let's hope that when mid april may uh, you know we are going to function again and then the switch on happen but if you already had a switch on then it's not so bad then you know you can have remote classes for rehabilitation and so on but if uh, you're not been switched on it's a bit of a problem i think you have to wait for the lockdown to be over or somebody can travel to your place or you can travel to your nearest center uh, and then have the activation yeah uh, roshni uh, yes sir yes sir roshni now usually what we do when we do the switch on we give them progressive maps like program 1 program 2 program 3 program 4 progressive maps which means program 1 usually will have a very soft map which means the loudness is very less the program 4 will have a little louder map okay now what the parents we are what we advise to the parents is they can change the program program 1 to program 2 to program 3 to program 4 instead of coming here for mapping now for example if somebody if they reached program 4 then we would advise usually we advise them to use the uh, the loudest map for at least for a period of 3 to 6 weeks so it really doesn't uh, uh, matter even if it's going to be another 3 weeks time not a problem but in case if you feel the child is not able to hear properly even with the loudest map all that what you can do is instead of bringing the whole family if someone can bring the process alone to us okay now with the previous maps we have developed a strategy where we can create and the progress in maps based on the existing data what we have we can create further progress in maps we can load those maps and give it to them so if the father alone can bring the processor to us we can also help him that is also yeah if they can courier it if the courier is working if they send it then we can still uh, do it and uh, give it back to them. that is also possible rajesh sir uh, i mean uh, mohan sir actually during the uh, surgery after uh, the implantation is properly done how do you uh, find out that i mean guess the response that the response is working uh, a little successful can you explain that yeah that's an excellent question see uh, the the uh, Earlier days, Roshni, when I'm talking about 90s, 90s we could not test it. So we, when we did the surgery, we had a you know period of about three weeks when the activation was done, the switch on was done, and only then did we know whether the device was working or not. So there was a period of suspense. You know, all of us would be uh, you know uh, keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that it's going to work. Today it's not the scenario. Today on the table, the team can know for sure a that the child is hearing, b that the device is functioning well, and even we know at what level it's functioning. So this is because we have a means of actually stimulating the electrode and recording the waves from the brain. So when we stimulate the electrode, just like in any hearing, if you hear a sound in the ear. Uh, sound reaches the inner ear, the cochlea, and then electrical waves are generated, which go on to the brain and reach the surface of the cortex of the brain. Similarly, in the cochlear implant, when you stimulate the electrode in the implant, electrical waves are generated, which travel up the uh, auditory pathway to reach the brain, and we can record those waves. So, when we actually test on the table after the surgery, at the end of surgery, we give stimulus and we record the uh, waves, and we know. that this child is hearing 
we also know at what level it's giving. We can test different electrodes and make sure that all the electrodes are functioning well. So all this is possible. So today when a surgeon has done the surgery, the audiologist does the test on the table and before we leave the, the, so the operating room, operating suite, we know for sure this child has a device which is excellent, the device is functioning well, the child is hearing well. So all this information we can get and we can tell the parents on. Uh, well, uh, Ranjit sir, actually, uh, I mean, uh, Mohan sir, actually, post the surgeries, there are uh, some uh, few recipients, some friends from my WhatsApp group also, they have all been saying that uh, post the surgery, they do have some facial changes or some facial uh, right? So, is it, uh, does it mean that they become permanent or is it only no, very no, temporary? No, the, the during the surgery, the facial nerve is very close to the area of surgery. And the surgeon takes every care to protect the facial nerve. He supplies the half of the face and then do the surgery. But sometimes what will happen is this nerve may get, you know, slightly uh, disturbed because of either uh, you know, the heat of surgery or uh, doing surgery sometimes it just create heat, they can heat up the nerve. Or just a simple inflammation of the surgery can also cause inflammation in the nerve. And they'll have a facial weakness. But usually, uh, you know, uh, almost in all of them, it will recover. And if it recover, it may take anything from uh, two to four weeks, but they will invariably recover and will come back normal. So it's not an uh, uncommon thing. In fact, about, I would say, about 5% of patients who undergo cognitive front surgery may have a, a facial weakness. So this, invariably temporary and all of them will recover in usually within about a month or so. There's one question about device failure, if I remember right. That's a very important question. You see, every device in the world will fail at some point of time. There's no doubt about it because there's no nothing called a perfect device which will last hundred years. Nothing, there's nothing like that. In general, we we say that the lifetime of a, a device is measured by what is known as a CSR, cumulative survival rate. So, how long does this device survive? In five years. What's the percentage of devices surviving? In 10 years, how does it survive? In 20 years, how does it survive? On an average, every implantee, if you do the implant at the age of one, by the time the child has reached, let's say, 99 or 100, the child would have gone on an average of at least about three devices. So this is the calculation. So you can assume that on an average, a well-done surgery with a good device will last for anything from 25 to 30 years, after which it might need changing for various reasons. It could be because the device itself is not functioning as efficiently as before, or it could be because the technology has superseded. Uh, more advanced technology has come in and this will have to be replaced. Either way, we can replace the external components very easy to replace. We replace almost every five years since we created. But the inner component, which is surgically implanted, can be removed and replaced. This is what we call an explant pre-implantation. Explant taking it out and pre-implantation putting it back in. Now that's done quite routinely, you know, in big centers like ours where we have thousands of patients. There will always be a proportion of patients will be coming for device failures and we have to redo it. On an average, it's about one out of hundred, you know, one or two out of hundred. So if you're going to do that, then the procedure is done under anesthesia, just like original surgery, but it's a much simpler procedure. It takes much less time because everything is already done. All you have to do is to expose the elect implant, electrodes, take it out and put back a new one and, and, and the thing job is done. And we test again on the table to make sure it's functional. So this happens in a small proportion of patients, as I said, about one to two percent parties. Uh, but uh, almost everybody will have at some stage replacement of their implants. Uh, it's only a question of time because there's nothing like a perfect device which will never fail. You know, 
And there's no nothing like that in the world. There's no device that you can think of, or no equipment, no electronic equipment, nothing that you can think of last forever and ever. Uh, okay. Uh, this. Uh, for. Uh... Hello, Roshni. Uh, yes, Ranji sir. Yeah, I see. I mean, um, there was one more question which uh, you have sent it. Maybe Mohan sir can answer that question. There's one question somebody of somebody has asked. Whether MRI scans are possible after CA surgery, and what are the necessary steps to follow? Okay. Yeah, uh, about the MRI. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know yeah. about that. M MRI. Uh, you know, today is the era of all the companies that are now bringing up MRI compatible implants. Okay. You know, what does it mean? Now it means that if you're going to have an MRI, usually the specifications here, they have said it's 1.5 Tesla MRI compatible or 3 Tesla MRI compatible. Now what it means is that if you're going to have an MRI, you don't have to remove the implant. Okay, you just have to put some braces and then you can go and uh, some you know, bandaging or support for the implant and then they can go and do it within the gantry. But you must remember. An MRA compatible implant does not mean that the implant will not cause a shadow over the MRA scan. What do I mean? Supposing you have to scan a bit of the brain here, the electrode is here, the electrode will sh throw a shadow over that area. Whether it's MRA compatible or not. MRA compatibility only means you don't have to take it out, that's all. But it will still hide a portion of the uh, brain which is near the uh, magnet and the shadow varies it depends on the, the type of the implant and but invariably every implant will throw some shadow over that part of the brain which is near to it but the rest of it will be seen so if it, you are looking at the scan I mean you are trying to scan a part of the brain which is away from the implant that's fine there's no problem but if you want to go close to and check the brain which is very very close to the, uh, on the implant then this could be a problem. So in that case, you may have to do a CT scan rather than an MRI to get the information. So MRI compatibility means you don't have to remove the implant when you're doing an MRI, but it doesn't mean that it will not throw a shadow over the brain. Since you've explained about this MRI uh, very nicely, I think that means that we don't have, I think MRI should be the last thing uh, people should, should, like, should look at when it comes to choosing cochlear implant. Because I think the most important thing is uh, hearing sound and getting the normal hearing quality. It should be uh, as normal as any other normal human being because if that is what we get. I think that should be. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more, Roshni. I think it's very important. You see, every company will come up with some hype about why they should have information by the implant. But end of the day, it's like buying a car, you know. Now, a car, if you're going to buy a car, then one company will say, my car has the best audio system. Okay? Another car, company will come and say, my car has the best AC filtration system. But you're not buying a car for the audio. You're not buying a car for the AC filter. You're buying a car because you want to travel from point A to point B. Without any problem. So that's what we're looking at. Similarly, as you said, for you're buying and you're getting an implant, you're getting an implant because you want to hear. And the best implant is the best implant which gives you the best sound quality for hearing. Not necessarily the MRI compatibility, whether it is water resistant, whether you are going to be you know doing this, they're all helpful, but that's not the main criteria for choosing. You're absolutely right. So people have to have this focus, you know, when choosing a, a device. Now, why are we choosing a device? What is the most important thing that I'm looking for in the device? That's the most important consideration. Other considerations, yes, they're helpful, but you know, they are they are number two and number three in priority, not number one. I agree with you. It's a very very sensible common sense approach. Uh, uh, Mohan sir, actually, uh, this is, I'm asking this on behalf for new parents now. There'll be probably small children who are 
probably uh, newborns and going on to uh, one year and when they after the implantation at a very early stage and then they want to go for speech therapy so then or mapping then how is the audiologist going to figure out whether the mapping is all right for the child from the child's response yeah. because encouraging children to get it done as early as you know, nine months, ten months, because the results are so much better, and also because we have better tools for assessing the hearing. Similarly, we also have much better tools for checking out that the maps are very good. And uh, for example, there's a tool which we have, which is known as a cortical book potential. Where you can actually check the levels in the, in the brain, you know, where the cortex, where, is, where the sound is reaching, and assess that this child is not only hearing but it's also progressing. So there are very sophisticated tools, and these are all available now. Uh, in, in fact, in, uh, it's very much available with Ranjit. So it's possible to not only make sure that the map is good, it's also possible to know that this child is progressing, that the brain is maturing, and it's also possible to predict that this child is going to be a very good performer. All these are possible today. So, so we have tools with us which are very sophisticated where we can directly map the auditory part of the brain to see how this is responding to the map the child has, and the sound from the being given, and how is this child progressing, and how is it Going to do in the future, in the near future, not the distant future, but the near future. Yes, you can say it's a very uh, you know, today that the tools are available. It's, it's not uh, you know numbers of like science. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, that's all I have uh, for the. Well, I think we have, we've uh, covered pretty much uh, most of the things. Uh, two, hours, two hours we have been at it, and, and, and uh, realize the time we flew. And uh, I think uh, we've discussed most of the issues, but end of the day, I think the take home message from this is. You know, we will be doing cochlear implants and we'll be doing it hopefully pretty soon. You will take some precautions, but we'll be definitely doing it pretty soon. And I think the moment the lockdown is over, we intend starting, you know, so that we don't keep children waiting. Uh, so parents won't have to be anxious. It only yeah. goes a few more weeks. But, uh, you know, we will definitely do it. Uh, but till then, please be safe. Please be safe. Be at home. Remember, any person you meet anywhere, you go to the shop, you go to the supermarket, you go anywhere, the person next to you could be a carrier. Remember, keep that thought in your mind and you're safe. Wear a mask all the time. When you go out, remember every person you come close to is potentially a carrier. Maintain not just one meter, as you know, most governments are encouraging. I tell my patients, maintain two meters. That's very safe. If something falls violently, you are still safe. Keep two meters distance wherever possible. If you go to a shop, it's crowded, forget it. Come back. Go on the next day. Go earlier on. So go at a time when there's no crowd. But please, please, please be safe. You know, don't, don't take any chances. You know, things are not uh, you know, getting better, you know, we're slowly moving to more and more difficult times. So we really need to be cautious and uh, I'm very worried about uh, all of my children, my uh, implantees, my adult implantees. I, I want them all to be safe and, and uh, we'll get over this. I'm sure we'll get over this crisis. Uh, the human race has survived many crises and we will get over this. Uh, and our ingenuity will pull us through. We will develop vaccines. We develop effective drugs. I have no doubt about it. It's only a question of time. But till then, stay safe. You know, keep keep safe distance from people. Wash your hands frequently. Don't touch your face or nose. 
and uh, uh, you know uh, wear masks when okay? that's a take home message from me i thank you all for uh, you know your uh, participation and, and, and very interesting questions thanks to roshni for organizing this you know it's a wonderful uh, feeling to uh, you know a good way of spending time in the evening with all of you uh, we look forward to more more such uh, events thank you roshni. thank you uh, mohan sir and thank you ranti sir roshni. for uh, sparing your time for roshni can you hear me okay i just saw two questions on this side one is about uh, one is from uh sanshan kaushik i think where uh, uh, a stylus underwent cochlear sorry vivek bhai bob stylus underwent cochlear implant in bob in january his question is is there any way of online avt therapy yes it is definitely possible a lot of patients are actually undergoing therapy now the only uh, the only problem at the moment is we are trying to see how to schedule it because we have so much of demand now. But definitely we will uh, take this, and uh, by next week, by Monday, one of my therapists will contact uh, uh, Vivek, and then they will give some. Uh, uh, they will organize an online therapy. That's number one. And number two is uh, Amrita Churashia has suggested that you no, know, she can. She is advising to use a Ling uh, Six Sound check. Uh, for testing the thing, that's a good advice. So what what I would uh, uh, tell you, if it is okay with you, so maybe next week once again, you no, know, if you can organize a meeting like this, or we also have the uh, uh, the uh, portal to host meetings. So we can host two meetings for parents if they're interested. One to give a specific care and maintenance of each devices, so we can do it. And second, what are the tips for the parents to give therapy at home? Okay, what are the basic tips from our therapists? Can I advise what are the basic tips that the parents can follow at home to give therapy during the childhood period? These are the two important topics that we can also discuss, and we are open for discussion. We are willing to spend some spend time with the parents. And uh, maybe Roshi can coordinate with uh, the parents, and you fix up two dates. Okay, uh, one could be a uh, uh, Tuesday, or one could be one is Tuesday and Wednesday, or Wednesday Thursday. Could please fix it, and let us know. We'll be happy to share some of the information. Thank and you. Also, if any other parents uh, need a therapy, uh, online therapy, please ask them to write to us. We will see how we can accommodate them as well. Uh, thank you, Ranjit sir. Uh, also, but last but not the least, but it's just that uh, right now during this lockdown, because all the shops are all shut, and we, uh, parents are really uh, wondering what to do or how to go about batteries. They're all waiting. So, what is the solution that you can suggest now, especially if they are run out of batteries? Yeah, uh, um, the, if, you, if you look at the See, so look at the metal and the cochlear devices. Uh, the metal devices, you can use any kind of battery. You can even use a normal system battery, which is available uh, in many places. You can even buy it online. Uh, now, you do not have to get it online, but you can get it from uh, shops. In case if they need those batteries, we have stock different batteries, we can give them. Now, especially for the uh, nucleus implant user, they use implant plus batteries. Okay. Now, the implant plus battery, it does not mean that you have to use only implant plus batteries. You can also use regular 600 batteries. But the, the regular 600 battery has some limitations when you use it on a nucleus device. One is the longevity of the battery is less. Another one is the constant supply of the power is little intermittent. I mean, I mean that's what they say. But apart from that, there is no harm in using the battery. You can still use the battery in case if they can't get an implant plus battery, they can use a regular system by battery. But if they need an implant in the battery or a regular system by battery, uh, we have sourced enough batteries with us. It's available. And a lot of patients are buying it now, even during this COVID period. And there, there are different modalities of uh, 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 sending the batteries to them. And uh, we can figure out a way to help them. But please ask them to get in touch. We'll see how we can help.
Thank you, Ranji sir, and uh, thank you, Mohan sir, for being part of this webinar today. It has been really very interesting. In fact, I also gained a lot of uh, knowledge and information. It's uh, very uh, interesting, especially during this lockdown. And uh, for many who are outside Chennai, also they also get to understand this whole thing in English. So thank you very much, and a big salute to both of you for. Uh, working so hard during this lockdown right now and ensuring that everybody uh, is getting their ears treated and meeting their needs, especially when they need to hear and communicate. So kudos and a big clap to both of you for all the hard work that you're putting up right now. Of course, there's a trend going on where uh, everybody's saluting all the doctors for the hard work during the pandemic. And today, I am saluting both of you on behalf of all the recipients, including myself, for uh, doing so much for us. Thank, Thank you, Rashmi. Thank you. God bless you. Stay safe. Thank you.